Um, so here I'm showing the DT Center web page, and I will navigate to the agenda for this week. So I'll click on uh, Community Code, Met Plus, User Support, Training, Met Plus Training Series 2021, and Agenda. Since the last session, we've adjusted the format of the agenda to include more information. So for each week, we'll list any prerequisites that are expected to be completed before uh, to be fully prepared for the training content and links to the content that will be covered, including presentations and hands-on activities. Uh, for the first week, the only prerequisite applies to users who are using their own workstation for the tutorial as they are responsible for installing the tools themselves. Um, and after the sessions are completed, we'll, we will post the recordings of the training so that you can review the content as needed. So here for week two, we'll assume that you've completed the tutorial instructions through the Met Plus How to Run section. And just to review, the section involves running the example wrapper use case and looking at the log output. Um, so most of the breakout groups last week were able to get through this content during the session, uh, but please make sure to do that on your own if you did not. Um, it also doesn't hurt to refresh your memory. George, may I interject here? For, for those of you who had planned to work on Hera, uh, as I had to demonstrate today, um, I was able to get set up on WCOS. So if any of you have WCOS accounts and would like to get set up there, the instructions are not integrated in the, the tutorial, but I will go ahead and post them in the chat now um, so that you can get set up there if you'd like. Great, thanks, Julie. I'm an, I'm an what if we don't have a WCOS account? Uh, do you happen to have access to JET? The tutorial, there are tutorial instructions already listed for JET. That's a possibility as well. And those are already contained on the website. OK, I'll work on JET. Um, also, a reminder uh, to direct any questions to the Met Plus GitHub discussions page, which can, which can be found in the Discussions tab of the Met Plus GitHub repository page. Um, another um, reminder is that the pace for this training series can be adjusted as needed, so please don't hesitate to let us know if we are moving too quickly through the content, and we can adjust accordingly. WCO is already available because there was a switch to the schedule. Yes, it's already available. OK, thank you. You're welcome. So this week, we'll cover the plot data plane, Gen VX mask, and PCP combined tools. Uh, we will be demonstrating how to use these tools directly on the command line as opposed to running them as part of a Met Plus use case. Um, and this is sort of different than a lot of the other examples we will be showing using the Met Plus wrappers. Um, there are a few reasons why we're doing this today. Um, one is to verify the that the input data can be read. Uh, the plot data plane tool is used to generate images from gridded data. Um, this is often used to verify that the input data is properly read into the Met tools and mapped to, to the appropriate grid locations. If the resulting plot um, from a call to plot data plane looks good, then you can assume that the other MET tools will be able to read and process that data. Uh, another reason is um, some users may want to generate some static files once to use in their use cases. Um, and so the GenVX mask tool can be used on the command line to generate those masking regions and then pass directly into their use cases for each run. And uh, a final reason, or not the final reason, but another reason, um, to run the tools on the command line is to test them out. Uh, so tools like PCP, PCP Combine have a lot of flexibility in how they can be run. Uh, so it's wise to test out running those commands manually before automating them in the wrappers to avoid confusion and ensure that you're gener generating the results that you expect. Um, and so now I will hand it over to John for hey, a presentation George. on plot data plane. 
Yeah. There was there was a question in the chat from Ben Cash. I think it would be worthwhile talking about. He's asking, are we going to be doing breakout sessions today, um, like we did last week, or not? Uh, that is a good question. So we won't be switching to um, to separate breakout groups, um, but if you do want to follow along with some of the hands-on instructions, it would be good to log into those machines uh, to the machine that you'd be working on. Uh, okay. Follow up Thanks, question George. then. Uh, did uh, did the IP addresses change for the AWS instances? Because that was something we talked about at the last session. Yeah, this is Hank. This is Hank. Um, we decided to just keep them running. Um, just uh, see how much it would cost and um, for ease of use. So you should have the same IP address. Okay, great. Let me know if you don't, and I'll I can look into it. Uh, could you could you drop the link to that spreadsheet into the chat uh, so I don't have to go I think I can. chase it through through my emails? Thanks. No problem. Okay, so uh, this is John Halligatway. I'll turn on my camera to say hello. So, hi everybody. Um, I am a software engineer working on the development of the Met tools primarily. And um, George, can you confirm that you can see my presentation? I, I can see the slides and then the section for notes below it. You do, okay, so let me switch to uh regular slideshow how about now you see yeah, the, just the title the slide no it looks the same to me let's see how about now it um somebody uh, ben cash actually can you tell me do you see uh, the presenter mode or do you see the regular uh regular presentation title slide Uh, I see the title slide, and I can see all of your thumbnails down the left. Okay, shoot. Well, that's a presenter mode. Let me, um, I think what I'll do is just present in this way, unless someone else has a um, has a suggestion here. Um, I think you're sharing uh, a tab, or I think you should share your screen instead share of the entire screen. Yeah. Okay. I will try that. Okay. Well, uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and get started. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, I'm John Halley Gatway. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, the plot data plane tool. So, you, um, and I, I imagine you guys can see the text I've written up here for the for these slides now. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, if you have two monitors, you need to switch monitors because we, we are seeing the presenters mode. There. How about now? Here we go. Thank oh, you. perfect. Okay. Uh, Yay. So, um, so if you look in the top left corner of this uh, this wire diagram of MET version 10.0, you'll see the these gridded forecast data and gridded analysis data gray boxes. Um, really, I'm going to be talking about uh, the tools to use to to um, to display data from from to basically display this gridded data. Um, so the met plot the plot data plane tool is here in this little green oval. Each one of the ovals in this wire diagram is one of the executables in met. Um, many of the details we'll discuss about plot data plane are transferable to the rest of the met tools. And we'll also also discuss later um, Met's Python embedding capabilities. You notice there's another tool named Plot Point Obs further down here. Um, that tool can actually plot both gridded and point observations, but the configuration file for that is a little bit more complex. So we're just trying to get started uh, with the Met tools in as simple a way as possible. So, uh, what type of gridded data can the Met tools read? Um, originally, Met was created to read the GRIB1 output generated by the WARF post processor which is now the unified post processor. Um, so MET was, when, when UPP was enhanced to write GRIB2 output, MET was enhanced to read it. It also reads a few different flavors of gridded NetCDF files, including the NetCDF out, 
output files from other MET tools. The uh, out, NetCF output from the WARF and TERP utility for those people running WARF. And also NetCF files following the climate forecast or CF convention for short. Um, the CF convention is widely used and supported. Uh, if you're formatting files, data files yourself, we've generally encouraged users to follow that convention. Um, in the last few years, we've also added support for passing gridded data as input to MET via Python scripts, which is which we call Python embedding. And um, while this has opened up MET to lots of other sources of data, it also comes with some other challenges that I'll, I'll talk about later. So this slide here links to details about the map projections uh, for the gridded data that MET supports. I'm not covering those details here, um, but when I say gridded data, I mean data that is defined on one of these projections listed here. And the metadata for each of these input file formats, it specifies a projection in grid parameters. So these slides are posted in PDF format on the agenda page that George showed in the beginning. And if you, if you download the PDF, then you should be able to click that link to take you to the um, user's guide, which has more details about map projections. Um, I've got a slide here about the ASCII configuration files that drive the MET tools to basically introduce the concept of configuration files. We'll be seeing many more details about MET and MET plus configuration files in the coming weeks. But when you run a MET tool on the command line, the work it does is specified by the contents of these configuration files. The number and type of config files read really depend on the tool being run. Generally, all tools start by reading the config constants file, which is listed first. That basically just defines um, some, some constants like none, stat, or both. So basically defines some keywords um, to, make, to make the configuration file, the constants of the configuration file a little more human readable. Um, so for tools that create plots, which the plot data plane tool does, the next thing we do is read the config map data file, um, which defines what map data to be read and, and how to plot it. If the tool supports configuration options like the grid stat tool, for example, it'll read the default configuration file for that tool. And lastly, it'll read any, if, if, the, if the tool supports a dash config option on the command line, it'll read the user specific configuration file passed in the command line to override any of the default setting it read previously. So the plot data plane tool itself does not support a full input configuration file. However, it does read a configuration string, which we'll see. And that config string is basically processed as a miniature inline configuration file. So that's why I wanted to introduce the concept of configuration files here. So here's the usage statement for plot data plane. It's pretty simple. Um, it, over the years, doing MET support or support for the MET tools for the last decade or so, we find it to be really, really helpful in diagnosing obvious problems in reading data. Um, that's why we're starting with this tool today. Um, so basically, if the plot data plane tool can read the data you request from the input file and create a plot of it and orient, orient it correctly on the globe, you can be pretty confident that the other MET tools will be able to do the same. Um, so here we have in the usage statement, uh, three required arguments, the input file to be read, the output file to be written, which is a postscript file, and then the field string. And I'll talk more about the field string uh, further, further in future slides. The ones in square brackets are optional arguments. So generally, the config string needs to be a, uh, it kind of defines the data that you want to read. And the way you format it depends on the type of data you're reading. Um, here we have details about GRIB1 and GRIB2 files and GRID and NetCDF files. And the config string should have defined both the name and the level string. So for GRIB data, the name is set to just the GRIB abbreviation. Um, there's a link here to some uh, to a table which defines some common ones. So for example, TMP for temperature, APCP for accumulated precipitation. The level string, so, so in a GRIB file, you'll often have multiple records for temperature just at different levels, different pressure levels, height levels. And the level string defines which one of those records you want to use. For NetCDF files, generally you define the name as the NetCDF variable to be read. And the level is a string which defines how to index into a multi-dimensional uh, variable to extract out a 2D slice of data. I, I don't think it's worth going through lots of details at this point, but I just want to kind of introduce the idea that Generally, name and level are what's specified for these in the configuration string. So here's an example, a simple example. We run plot data plane, read data from this GFS file, 
will write a, a, a postscript image named temp2m.ps because we're plotting the temperature variable from the two meters, so Z2, two meters. And that's what you get. That's the resulting image that's created. Now, if we were to do the same thing, but with Python embedding, we would run plot data plane. Now, instead of having a, an input uh, gridded data file, we would put this keyword, Python underscore NumPy. We give it an output file name, postscript image name to be created, so precip 24 hours. And now for Python embedding, we only specify the name. There's no level specified. And the name that we specify is this full string, which is the Python script to be run, followed by any optional command line arguments for that script. And that's what you'll get in the output. So I'm, I'm putting these up side by side to point out the differences. And the, the input file for Python embedding is this constant string Python numpy, whereas if you're reading data from a file, you list the file name instead. So let's talk about a little bit more about Python embedding. Um, Met supports it in three different ways, um, supports Python embedding. The first one, and the one we're talking about today, is to read two-dimensional gridded data. Um, it also can support Python embedding for handing point observations into the ASCII to NC tool. And it can also do it to hand, hand match pair data into the stat analysis tool. Uh, we're not covering either of those today. If you want to enable Python embedding, which is disabled by default, there are some compilation requirements that are described in Appendix F of the Met User's Guide. Um, first, the Python 3 instance that you're using must support NetCDF 4, um, which is what we use to read and write temp files for Python embedding. And it also must support X-Ray, and that NumPy and Pandas come with X-Ray. When you run the configure script, to compile MET, you must um, sp supply the enable Python option and have these environment variables, MET, Python, CC, and LD defined to, um, to point to the instance of Python against that, that you're using for the compilation. All the existing builds, pay all the existing builds on JED and Hera and in the AMI are all compiled with, with Python support. Uh, when you're running, there are some runtime considerations for Python embedding. Um, you can you can uh, choose both Python NumPy or Python X-Ray. I, I won't won't give a Python X-Ray uh, example here. Um, there is a influential environment variable named Met Python EXE, which basically enables you to run a custom instance of Python and read and write a temp file. Um, I won't go through the details here, but that link to the runtime consideration takes you to the right spot in the user's guide to learn more about it. So uh, generally, uh, when you're doing Python embedding, um, there, there are three steps. And the first step is make sure that the Python script that you're running runs successfully on the command line. Basically, make sure your script doesn't error out. Second, run the, uh, this, the script via plot data plane and make sure it produces a reasonable plot. And then third, once you've confirmed that, then you can incorporate it uh, in that your Python embedding script into Met plus use cases, for example. So we list several examples of Python embedding on the Met website, and the link to it is, is shown here. All these examples um, are examples of running plot data plane for the reason I just listed, that it's, it's an essential step to make sure that you have the data oriented correctly. So here, just illustrating, if we had an example from this, from that, uh, from that page, first we run the Python th three script uh, manually, make sure that runs without error, and then we wrap it, wrap that command in plot data plane. So in this example, plot data plane, but, oh, I have a typo, um, followed by Python numpy keyword, the push script file to be created. And now here, instead of specifying the name and level, you only specify name, um, equal to the Python script followed by its uh, command line arguments. Note that in, when, you run Py, when you run it manually on the command line, you start with Python 3. When you run it via Python embedding, you remove that from the name stream. That, if this example produces that kind of plot. Um, and you know, it, it, the reason why this is important, it's you know, one downside to using Python embedding is that um, it's often it, 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 it's very common for the data to be plotted upside down or backwards or reflected, mirrored. Um, so one advantage to reading data from gridded data files like GRIB and NetCDF is that the software knows how to read the metadata from those files and orient the data correctly. 
with Python embedding, it's just taking the array of data that it's receiving in memory and plotting it. And unfortunately, it falls to the user to confirm that the data is oriented correctly. Um, the good news is it's uh, usually pretty easy to fix if the data is oriented incorrectly. Um, you can, you know, well place negative one in one of the dimensions of your Python script will do the trick. Um, if you have, if you're, if you're creating a new example of Python embedding and are having issues with that, please post to MetPlus discussions, or you can also search on that uh, examples page for, and generally search for negative one, and you'll you'll see examples of where we're flipping, reorienting the data. So um, I want to show one final example of running plot data plane with several options. So in this example, I'm reading reading data from a GFS file. And I'm plotting a, uh, a creating a push grip plot that I'm calling height underscore l0.ps. So um, if you look in a grip file at the records for height, you'll find that there's many, many height types of height. You can have, have the height of the cloud base, uh, height of the top of the cloud, tropopause height, freezing level height, all sorts of heights. All of them are encoded in grip, grip files with the um, at what level value of zero. And the way they're differentiated is by the grib level type. I know that by looking at the metadata for the grib file that the level type for the tropopause is seven. So here in this example, I'm saying, give me give me height for L0, um, but with a type of seven. So I know that's a tropopause. And then I'm showing off that I can also run this convert command to convert from meters to feet. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that this field string uh, is like a miniature configuration file. So it, it isn't only name and level that can be specified. If there's other configuration options that apply to the data, like the level type and the convert function, they can be included there as well. Rather than letting plot data plane scale to the range of the data present in the input file, I'm manually setting that range to be zero to 60,000. And I'm um, providing a title here using the optional title argument. And rather than, oh shoot, this is another typo. This should be color underscore table. Um, rather than using the default color table, I'm speci manually specifying one uh, here on the command line. And I want to point out if you run at verbosity level four, this dash V4, um, that increases the default verbosity level. And what I mean by verbosity is the amount of information that's printed out to the log file. It increases it from two to four. And when you run at four, you get some additional useful information. For example, here we see the, the range of the data prior to the convert command being applied and after the convert command being applied. Um, you also see information about the metadata, like the timestamps and, and that sort of thing. So just an example of running plot data plane with, with additional options turned on. And I think at this point, uh, I guess I'll ask for any questions before handing it off to Julie to demonstrate uh, the, the corresponding commands. Well, if there is no other question, may you ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm the beginner here, so where should I start? So, so uh, what what platform are you working on? Uh, Wolf model on Linux. And so, are you? Do you have? Did you complete the um, the the exercises from last week where we where we were setting up? Uh, your uh, uh, unfortunately, no. Okay, that's what I'd recommend. Go back to the agenda page and look at the content from last week, and mm -hmm. uh, go from there. And if you have questions in in that, please follow up with through Met Plus discussions. Thanks. Yeah, Evan, I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Hey, John. Uh, so this is great. I I saw that on one of your first slides, you said that generally plot data plane and the other met tools can read net cdf data that's uh, cf compliant and I, I guess i'm just wondering if you know if that includes like the the surface and atm files the net cdf files that come directly out of the right component when you run the ufs i do not um there is a, you know, there are several tools, websites out there that provide CF, uh, uh, that check for CF compliance, where you upload a file and it checks the compliance. And 
I, I would say I would start there and see if see if it qualifies as being TF compliant. And if so, try to run it through plot data plane. And if you run into problems and you know expect something to work and it doesn't, then post posting the discussions is the right way to move forward. Okay, great. Thank you. So Julie, I will hand it off to you. John, there's actually a question in the chat. It says, yeah. uh, can you discuss about differences slash uses between Python embedding in MET and using Python with MET plus? Okay, yeah, it's just different uses of Python. That's a great question. So um, Python embedding in MET, an example I showed was to serve up gridded data to the tools in memory. So basically, you let's say you have data in an HDF5 file that MET doesn't have native for which MET doesn't have native support, and you want to read that data into MET, then writing a Python embedding script to serve up that data in memory is the way to way to do it. Um, the the Python in the MET MET plus wrappers are used to automate calls to the tools. Um, so they're basically two different uses of Python, but for different different things. And I think as we go through the exercises, that'll be it'll become more apparent. Uh, Bin Bin, I see every hand raised. Go yes, ahead. I have a question uh, regarding Python embedded. Uh, so uh, your example is uh, just an uh, entire uh, domain. Uh, uh, does Python embedded can uh, can plot the some sub domain? I mean, uh, a small domain within uh, an entire domain. Um, so you're, you're saying could you, you know, you, okay. So you're, you're talking about processing a subset of a domain. And so really, I guess the, the point is in the Python embedding script that the user writes, really the sky is the limit. You can read, um, whatever data you'd like, create whatever data you'd like, but you have to pass it to met following some documented conventions. Um, so, for example, Ben Ben, you could write a script that you know uh, reads a reads global data, and uh, maybe let's say global lat long data, and then subsets down to a small region of the globe. And you could hand that hand that subset of data to Met as long as you okay. But you'd also have to define the grid parameters for that subset. Um, so, um, you know, it it it's really up to you uh, how you construct the data, how you prepare the data for use by MET. Um, but there's nothing special in the plot data plane tool. Um, the Python embedding feature functionality within MET, we just, it's it's as if MET read the data, this gridded data from, from a file. It's just that we're getting it through memory from Python instead. The examples we have posted on the MET website are pretty simplistic. Uh, we just read some sample data from an unsupported NetCDF file format or from an HDF5 file, um, but we, we are not doing anything too fancy, but you could you could definitely enhance your Python script to make it as fully featured as you'd like. And John, there's another question in the chat. Do we use Python embedding for advanced derivations involving multiple fields on file? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I, um, I if, if you have multiple fields in a file and you wanna derive a, a new field from them, then Python embedding would be a great way to go. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to hand it off to Julie to, to step through these examples. We have a lot to cover in this hour. So off to you, great. Julie. Thank you. And if folks, um, if you could please turn off your cameras, that would be wonderful. We would, we would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so I am presenting here. Hopefully you can see my screen. And right now I am on the plot data section, plot data plane section of the uh, training. So it, it's, right, it's the section right after MET plus setup. It's the very first link here. First thing to note is if you are returning to the tutorial and you'd like to work through this hands-on session, you need to source the tutorial setup scripts before running the following instructions. So as mentioned here, if you're unsure if you've done this step, please navigate to this page. Uh, this is the page that we did last time where we uh, CD'd into our working directory, and then we sourced the tutorial setup script, uh, setup script here. So um, please go ahead and do that if you haven't already. Um, once again, for users on Hera, um, 
uh, since Hera is not available today, I did switch to using WCOS. If you have access to JET, that is open as well. Uh, if you need the instructions, they are posted in the chat. Please look for the last instructions. I um, I quickly set up this morning and I left, I, I took an example from Cheyenne to set up the scripts and left Cheyenne in the name. And there were some other errors. Um, you, you need to probably run module purge before you run these so that you don't have any conflicting modules. So uh, the last set of instructions that were posted will hopefully be accurate and get you set up with what you need. So talking about um, plot data plane here, um, some of this John had mentioned, but so I might repeat some of the things he said. Um, so we're going to use plot data plane, which reads a single two-dimensional field of gridded data from a specified input file and writes a postscript file containing a spatial plot of the data. So right now, um, if we just print plot data plane, we should see the usage statement as we see here. So I will go ahead and do that. And as expected, here's the usage statement. We can see the three required arguments along with any optional arguments, some of which we'll talk about today. Going on to the next section, uh, John spoke about the field string. Uh, basically, we need to ensure that the name and level entries are passed in so that we know exactly what we should be um, using with plot data field, which fields we should be using. As John mentioned, um, we can use GRIB1 or GRIB2 files as inputs. Uh, here's an example of the way the field string would be formatted for a GRIB1 or GRIB2 file. We can also use netcdf files as input, uh, in which case here's an example of a name in a field string. Notice the field string is different. It doesn't have a P500, for example, for a pressure level, but rather has this sort of uh, syntax and this would extract a two-dimensional field of data from the last two dimensions, the asterisk and asterisk, of a net CDF temperature variable with these being constant. And we'll, we'll talk about that in this hands-on training as well. And then you can also use uh, Python embedding, in which case uh, the name would simply be the, the name of the Python script um, and then any the parameter arguments to that Python script. So we will also take a look at that as well. Um, if you do encounter any problems and should get a, a syntax error like this, there's likely a problem with the way you've uh, defined name and level, your, your fields. So um, that's something just to be aware of. This is a, a common error that we see um, to just ensure that things are formatted. For example, single quotes in the end, double quotes in the middle. So um, there's some more discussion here about that and also in the user's guide. So we'll move on to plot grib data. And we want to start by creating a directory for our plot data plane output. So I will go ahead and copy and paste this command to make this directory. And then we're going to run plot data plane to plot two meter temperature from a GRIB1 input file first. So we will do that. You can see our input file and its path is listed here. Our output file name is here. And then we've got the, the name and the level formatted uh, just as we discussed on the last page. So we can see we uh, had a successful, a successful creation of a file, the Postscript file here, and it mentions that it opened the data file. This was with a verbosity level of two. And so that is what you will get with a verbosity level of two, just the opening and the creating of the file. But as John mentioned earlier, we can run plot data plane with a higher verbosity level and it will give us more information. So let's go ahead and do that. And you can see, scrolling back up, that there was a lot more information printed out. Um, this will allow you to take a look at the grid definition, make sure it seems reasonable and what you expect. You can look at the range of values here and see if those are what you expect, and also the time information to see if it's, it's consistent with the input file name. So in this case, uh, the input file name was from 2005, uh, August 7th, and we can see that that data is here as well. So it is what we would expect and not something way off. So running with a ver higher verbosity level gives us a little more information. Um, I This is what we would look at to view the output file. I couldn't figure out how to access ghost view on WCOS, but there's another method to do that. Um, we can either run convert to create a PNG file here. We can use display to look at the PS file. So if you'd like to go ahead and convert, you're welcome to do so. I'm going to show how to use display uh, just with the postscript file. So there's a rotate option here that we can pass to it because we will need to rotate it. And if you'll bear with me, this takes a 
minutes pop up or so, so we'll wait for that to pop up. If I had not given it the rotate command, it would just be sideways, so um, we'll take a look at it the way it was meant to be looked at. Also, you can notice with the convert command, if you had converted it BNG, you would also want to use uh, rotate 90 there as well. And if you do know or have ghost view accessible, you can use that as well directly with the postscript file. All right, here it comes. OK, there you go. So it's always a good idea to take a look at the image you create and make sure it's what you expect. Um, so it's transparent background and, and color scale over here. There's no title on this one, but we will be creating a title in the next one. OK, so let's see. Moving on to the next step. Now we're going to use NetCDF uh, file to uh, create a Postscript file with plot data plane. First, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the, the header file. And we can see the dimensions here, just as we expect. I'm going to close Slack. My apologies for all these messages. This typically does not happen. I don't know exactly what's going on. All right. OK, so back to this where we were verifying the projection or the dimension information, which is right here. It is exactly as we would expect. We can see uh, the fields here for uh, total precipitation, six hour. And uh, we note here that uh, this field has three dimensions, but the time dimension only has length one. So if we set the level to zero, asterisk, asterisk, that should do the trick to plot what we want to see. And that is what we are going to do here. And this time we're going to add a title. Please note that we have this dash title option right here. Um, and we'll run again with Robotti level four. Oops, wrong scroll window. OK, and so here we can see the minimum and maximum information and the time information again. Let's see where we get right here. Um, and it's exactly what we can see. We can either run convert to reformat again, or we can just run display. So let's go ahead and do that again. OK, and while that pulls up, I'll go ahead and talk about what we'll do next in the interest of time. So the next time, we're going to extract a specific time string from a precipitation data analysis. Because in the next case, there are four time dimensions and not just one. So you, you don't necessarily want to have to go and figure out which dimension your data um, corresponds to. So instead of having to figure that out, you can just go ahead and pass it the timing information so in this case, you can see here, instead of a zero, we have the time information listed here. And that allows for easier access. Here is that image we were waiting for. OK, and that looks like what we expect. We can see the range here from 0 to 101.086. And we can also see our title up here as well. So now if we run the next one, um, we're here we're also going to use the plot range option. And so if you are running plot data plane for multiple output times or data sources, you can use plot range to make the color scales comparable, which is, is very helpful. So we'll go ahead and specify that here, even though it's the same as what the default was. And again, we're changing. We don't have zero listed. We're going to specify a time. And we're also going to keep our title on there as well. OK, and so the post file was created. We, we won't take a look at that right now. And we'll move on here and take a look at the header file here for this next file. And uh, let's see, we're looking at uh, NCEP region ID. And we can see that it's a two-dimensional field right here. And so this time, we're going to specify a different color table other than the default one. And so we do that here with the optional dash color table option. And so we will create that plot.
and we can see that it was successfully created. And we'll skip the display option here too, and we'll continue along in the hands-on portion. Okay, so John talked about Python embedding, and we'll go over it a little here as well. And as he mentioned, it's also described in Appendix F of the MET User's Guide. So MET supports three types of Python embedding, reading a field of, a grid, of gridded data values, passing a list of point observations, and passing a list of matched forecast observation pair values. So right now, we're only going to go over the first type, the reading of a field of gridded data values. And first, we want to make sure that the command runs with our scripts using Python itself, completely outside of MET. So you can see we'll formulate the command with Python 3 here. And we're going to go ahead and pass it the Python script and any um, arguments here. So in this case, this sample ASCII NumPy script reads data from the input forecast.txt file and gives it a name forecast. So let's go ahead and do that just to make sure it's successful outside of MED and that there's no issues with the script itself. And that was successful. We can see um, some information printed out here, the input file, the data name, shape and type, and the attributes. So now that we did that and we made sure that worked correctly, we can go ahead and run plot data plane. Since there's no uh, specific input file, we're going to run with uh, Python NumPy. You could also run with Python X-Array, but it works slightly different. So right now, demonstrating with Python NumPy, um, we're going to give it that as it as its input file. And then we have our PostScript file here as our output file. And here is where in name, the name field, where we specify the Python script and, and any parameters to the, any arguments to the script. So let's give that a shot. And that was successful. We have successfully created a PostScript file. So here um, we talk about met Python exe a little bit. Um, so it says that when MET is compiled, it links the Python libraries that it uses to instantiate a Python interpreter at runtime. That compile time instance does have a few required packages, but will likely not include all packages that every user may want to load. You may find that your Python script runs fine on the command line, but plot data planes call to Python can't load a requested module. In that case, you can set the MET Python exe environment variable to tell MET which instance of Python you'd like to run. So that is why, how that is used. Um, so in this case, we're going to run the command which just shows the version of Python already present in your path. And then um, this, as it says, it should produce the same results. But if you look closely at the log messages, which we will do, you'll see that the custom Python version writes a temporary file, and this compile time version reads data from it. So let's run that. And we'll take a look at the log output. OK. So as you can see now, um, previously, well, actually, it did show a temporary file previously. We do see a temporary file here as well. Interesting. Um, well, we can see the temporary file is referred to here. And um, we have the same. We did successfully create, create a file. There are um, several Python embedding examples on the sample analysis groups sample analysis scripts page of the MET website, which is linked to here. And each example includes a Python script and sample input data file. And you can also see MET plus Python embedding example uh, there on, on our website as well. And that concludes the end of the section. The next section would be PCP combine, um, but we are not going to talk about that today. So I believe I will pass it over to Tina now for the next section. Yeah, so let me get my PowerPoint up here. All right, can everybody see this? Is it displaying? Yeah. OK, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the MET tools, PCP Combine and um, GenVX Mask. And we're running a little bit short on time. So I'm not sure I'll get all the way through this, but um, we'll go as far as we can. Um, so this is uh, kind of that overview of MET. And I've got the two tools circled. So these are reformatting of gridded data. 
And then I'm going to talk about uh, the PCP combined first, and then we'll go on over to Gen VX Mask. So PCP combined stands for precip combined, um, but it can be used on other fields by specifying a field name. So um, essentially what it does is mathematically combines fields across multiple files. And there's, there's four options for how you can do this. So add, sum, subtract, and derive. So add, as it sounds, um, is just adding together precipitation files or precipitation over multiple files. So for example, if you have two three-hour precipitation accumulations and you want to create a six, you can add those two files together and you'll get a six-hour accumulation. And to run this version, you have to give the files and the accumulations. Then next option is sum. Um, which you can sum precipitation over multiple files. And um, if you're like me, you're thinking, well, how is add different from sum? And in this case, uh, it's the way that data is specified. So for add, you have to specifically give the files and their accumulations, whereas sum, you point to an init time and an, or a model initialization time, an accumulation and a valid time, and then a directory, and it will find the files that you want and sum them all together. And then third option is subtract, whereas you have two files and you want to subtract the precip precipitation in them. So as an example, if you have, you want to go from a 12 to a six hour accumulation. And then the fourth option is derive. And the derive command uh, uses say like, um, statistics so a mean or a maximum so you want to take a mean over a day or you want a maximum a daily maximum or daily minimum uh, you can get that with the derive command like other um, met tools it reads grib1 grib2 net cdf or python embedding um, and it writes uh, gridded net CDF, which can be used as input to other statistics tools. So um, we'll start uh, with it. Well, well, I guess we'll talk about usage first. Um, so the, the purple here are the required arguments and the kind of uh, light blue-ish color um, are optional arguments. So in this case, you need one. The usage would be to call PCB combine and then you have one of some add, subtract, or derive, not all of them, but you select one. If you don't pick one, sum is the default. And then you give it an input file and an output file. And there are a lot of optional arguments, but probably the most important ones that you'll use are the field and the name option. Uh, field would be specifying something other than APCP. So if your precipitation isn't named APCP or if you just want to do it on another field, um, you would specify uh, dash field, and then it would be uh, a field string like we just did with a uh, plot data plane. And then name um, is a way to name your output variables. And uh, I won't talk about the other ones at the moment. So we'll dive right into some examples. Uh, this first one is an example of using the sum option. So the top, we're summing two six hourly accumulation forecast files into a 12 hour. And so in this case, calling PCP combine with the minus sum option. And then the dates, the next string 2005-0807 is the date and 0000 is the time. So that's our um, model initialization time. And then six is our input accumulation. And then the next date string would be our valid time followed by the output accumulation that we want, which is 12 hourly. And then um, the minus PCP dir uh, is the directory where our data is located, where we'll be finding those files. So what do you do if you have an observation file which doesn't have a model initialization time? And that's the next example below. In this case, we're just using 0000, all zeros for our initialization time. And then one would be 
our input one hourly accumulation files. And then the valid time in this case is specified. So 2005-0807-12 UTC and um, the output accumulation it, uh, would be 12 hourly. So those are two examples of how to use the sum option. Uh, next, we'll talk about add and subtract. So you can use the add option for already binned precipitation. So the top we have adding two six hourly accumulation forecast files into a single 12 hour. In this case, we're assuming the name APCP. So um, PCP combined minus add. And then the first string below that is our the name of our first file, um, which is a grid file, followed by the accumulation time, so six hourly. And then the name of our second file, followed by the accumulation time. And then the, the last is the name of our output file is what we're giving it. So in the, uh, as I mentioned previously, differently from the sum command, in this case, you're we're specifying the files to add together and their specific accumulations versus um, just a directory. So next is the subtract option. So say we wanted to subtract a 36 hour preset minus a 12 hour for the, the 24 hour total. We're calling PCP combined with the subtract option. And then in this case, we're showing how to specify the field uh, name and level. So um, the first file is our 36 hour. So it's subtract one minus two. And then the second is our 12 hourly file. And then the third option or the, the final row is um, the output file name. So here's a visualization of how PCP combine works. So on the top are two three hourly accumulations. And in this case, it adds them together to produce the six hourly accumulation. Uh, the plots were made with plot data plane, which we just used. So you can see these two areas of precipitation, which have expanded to combine um, both of them, which is what we would expect as our output. So lastly, uh, an example of the derive command. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in this case, you want to use the derive option um, to, you know, say, compute a predicted temperature and humidity extremes. So in this case, it's calling met PCP combine followed by minus derive, and then we're giving it the statistics list. So the top example wants a min and a max. And then it's the input file name followed by, it looks like I might have min and max twice um, on this, which would be a typo, followed by the output file name. And then we're giving it two field options. So in this case, we're doing this for two variables, temperature and specific humidity. And then the last column is an example of how to set the output names. So minus name is the output names for a variable. So temp min, temp max, specific humidity min, and specific humidity max. And then the second example here is using the derive option to create, say, an ensemble average and standard deviation. So met uh, PCP combine and then minus derive, and then in this case, mean and standard deviation. Um, ensemble file list is a text file that contains a listing of all our input ensemble files. And then we're specifying 500 millibar height, so HDT level P500, that's pressure level 500 and then followed by our output file uh, name. So um, I'm going to kill this for a minute. Looks like I'm getting uh, close on time. Um, I don't know, should I continue on and do Gen VX mask, which is going to run over, or should we save this? Anybody have any thoughts? That makes no sense. Hey, Tina, thank you for this presentation. I think we should probably stop here. Okay. And we'll pick up Gen VX mask during the next session. Okay. That way, we if there's a, I mean, do we have any last minute questions that someone wants to ask really quick? Hi, I have my name is George. I have one question. I'd like to extract in from GFS grip two files, uh, 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 precipitation 
uh, on the specific uh, points. Is it possible to do it with uh, uh, Med Plus? Uh, I have I have observation station and at the specific uh, uh, coordinates. Yeah. Uh, so and yeah. I, I need to extract this pre precipitation um, from these uh, uh, points uh, for this point uh, uh, from the uh, uh, GFS grip into files. Is it possible yeah. to do it with uh, a Med Plus? Yes, it is. Um, uh, we have a specific tool that is focused on, um, uh, you know, matching up um, the gridded GFS or any other gridded model output with point observations, um, and then you know, pairing those up and, and writing out a matched pair, um, and also computing statistics. That's the point stat tool, and we'll be covering that a, a couple weeks into the um, tutorial. But we also do have um, examples of how to run point stat on the online tutorial if you want to jump ahead. Thanks. OK. Yeah. So it looks like Lin Zhu has a question. You want to go ahead, Lin? Yeah, this is Lin from EMC. I have a question about the uh, PCP drive. I saw it could, could find the mean value. Is it fine for the PCP drive to find the median value? I don't believe the median is supported. Um, we could look at the usage statement to see the list of uh, fields that are derivable. Um, checking that quickly, it is. Does anybody, anybody, anybody beat me to it? No. <laughs> okay, the, the, it is the min, the sum, the min, the max, the range, the mean, and the standard deviation. And the reason why we, it doesn't compute the median or any of the other percentiles is that in order to do so, we would need to hold all of that data in memory, all the input data in memory at the same time. All these fields that are derivable can be derived, uh, that, that are currently derivable, are, uh, can be computed. Uh, you don't have to store all the data. We, we, we can kind of keep track as we go to compute all of these things. Whereas the median, you'd need to hold all the data in memory, which makes the complexity of the data processing much higher. OK, thanks. Um, the ensemble, there. I think there are other tools in MET that can compute the median, but um, yeah, not sure off the top of my head. Um, Wesley, you had a question. I, I, I posted it in chat. It was just a, just a quick ask about PCP combine and Python embedding. Okay. So ba basically, I've I, I've been having trouble getting it to work. Um, just like I just started digging around with it today. But you, in order to use Python embedding, just use like the standard, um, yeah, name equals whatever, like that, and it should work. Yeah. So basically, a kind of big picture for Python embedding in the Met tools, anywhere you would normally specify an input gridded data file. Instead, you specify, uh, you know, the, the, the string Python NumPy or Python X-Ray, depending on how your uh, Python script is written. And then where you specify the, the field information to read data from that file, you instead specify the, um, the Python script to run. So, um, you know what I could do? If you'd like, if you just post this question into MetPlus discussions, then we could provide an example using some uh, you know existing data that lives in the met release of uh, to demonstrate using python embedding with pcb combined yeah i'll, I'll do that once we're done with the meeting appreciate appreciate sure. it thank you so it looks like we're a few minutes over are there any if, if there are any final questions we can stay on as long as needed to answer them um, please just raise your hand to to let us know Okay, looks like there's no other questions. So, Tara, any final words uh, before next week?
Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting, and we will talk to you again next week. Thank you.